take notes that we could pass over to her so she could massage it into the uh, official minutes of the meetings if we wind up with a quorum. Anybody want to take that on for, for just this meeting? Barbara, well, that'd, that'd be great if you could uh, do that. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, word for word, but, uh, you know, just to get the general gist of, uh, of what, we, uh, what we did in the meeting. All right. Uh, so let's, uh, now that we have a, uh, a meeting recorder, and we're also recording this uh, uh, meeting electronically, uh, we can get started with uh, the approval of the minutes from, well, actually, I don't think we have a quorum yet. So let's wait on that. But uh, did anybody have any uh, comments or corrections to the, the minutes that uh, were taken from last month? No, I don't think so. You're muted, Barbara, if you were talking to the meeting. Yeah, I had COVID last month, so I oh. wasn't in attendance. Ah, uh, well. That's right. I saw you uh, since then, yeah, and that's right. uh, you were you were talking about the uh, that. Well, I'm happy to see you uh, back back you. Uh, back on your feet. Thank you. Or, or you must be your, going around because I just seat. had it two weeks ago. <laughs> ah, well, my wife and I had it last fall, and uh, it felt like a bad cold. And, took the uh, recommended pills from the doctor and uh, was feeling fine a couple days later. So thank goodness for uh, yeah. vaccinations and, uh, and after infection pills. Okay. I don't have my agenda in front of me. Uh, what's the uh, next item on the menu here? Anybody have that? A, a solarized pro program report is number three after minutes number two. Ah, uh, well, I think the solarized program is essentially gone gone to sleep at this point. So, what actually that refers to would be the uh, uh, the heating campaign, and I think we have some people here who were involved uh, in that. Uh, you can't hear anything would like to say a few words about the uh, smart heating. I'm happy to. Uh, Great, so David. The county and a whole bunch of towns are now running an energy efficiency uh, and uh, cooling and um, heat smart campaign. And we are promoting uh, five different vendors throughout the county uh, who are involved in various aspects of from geothermal to uh, heat pumps of different sorts. Uh, and we have an informational session tomorrow evening at 630. Everyone should have gotten a notice and we're promoting, you know, that's basically what we're doing. We're not unlike uh, Solarize where we're trying to actually, um, you know, sign people up at no cost. We're, this is much more complicated and specific to people's needs. So we're encouraging people to learn more through these informational campaigns. Uh, as a matter of the uh, numbers and the, the grants, we've already submitted for a, um, a grant at the, at the county level from NYSERDA because we've passed our 15 um, person or residential signups um, uh, about a month ago, actually. So we're, we're just, you know, trying to promote this to get more people familiar with the concepts and with the cost effectiveness of a lot of these technologies um, now and into the future. That's what's happening. Great. Well, that sounds super. 15 people signed up already. And uh, it's probably twice that by now, but I mean, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these um, upgrades are just happening. 
So the question, and people, anyone that needs a new system is going to look at this technology and likely put it in because it just makes sense. Um, and the incentives are there. So, the, you know, we get credit as a campaign if they sign up uh, through our campaign and they go to one of our vendors. But there are plenty of people. This is, the, this. you know, we're just trying to kind of accelerate the adoption of this technology. Bob. Uh, David, I, we at our we had a meeting of our CSC the other day, and uh, Doug Craig mentioned that he thought there are now incentives in the IRA Act that will pay entirely for the installation of heat pumps for low to moderate income families who are making twenty less than twenty percent of the AMI in that area. Do you know of this? Is because we he seemed to think it was true, but we didn't really have any any. Uh, I, I don't have the details on that. I wish I was more uh, fluent in all of the, you know, a lot of these are new programs, but um, right. that's not something that I'm completely fluent in. Uh, this is something that um, uh, our Heat Smart Albany um, or Capital Region Heat Smart partner uh, and Christina Bons, I'm probably going to um, badger her name, unfortunately, Bonsack, I think is how it's pronounced. Yep. Uh, she's, if you're not in touch with her, she's someone that can help connect you with, with the information you're looking for. I'm pretty Great. sure. So I can, uh, I'll put a link. Uh, I can put her email in the, in the chat pad if that's helpful. I don't know if you've been in touch with her. No, that would be great. Okay. Uh, also, I, tomorrow night, there's information session. I'm sure that would be a question that'll yeah. be addressed tomorrow night. Yeah, that's a great opportunity to bring that okay. up, and, and right. that would be a gr great question to ask. All right. Very good. Thank you. We were just talking about the Heat Smart program for any of you who are just uh, joining us. Nice to see everybody. Uh, John, if I could ask you again, what's the next item on the uh, agenda there? Uh, Climate Smart Communities Report. Ah, very good. Uh, we have the countywide uh, group. If I could ask David to contribute a little bit about that, and then we can deal with uh, what's going on in the towns. Sure. Um, the Heat Smart campaign, we're also doing a, uh, a greenhouse gas inventory for the county. This is a municipal wide, uh, not a community wide. Um, uh, inventory so it's much narrower we're not looking at the entire county we're looking at just the facilities and the um the vehicles uh that the county uh manages which is you know substantial a lot of towns have done this and uh we are it's you know the next step following an energy benchmarking um project which we did last year uh we are looking seriously at how we could expand this into a community-wide inventory which we could potentially do in collaboration with towns. So they got credit and also could help with collecting information. Um, that would be the precursor of a climate action plan, which would be countywide. Uh, we have some funds, you know, from these grant programs that we'd like to try to earmark for some of these projects. Uh, they're not always an easy fit. So we're trying to figure that out. And some of it we could do internally and some externally. The other thing is we have a new coordinator, Don Meltz, um, has taken Wendy Madsen's place, and uh, we have our next meeting on Thursday, uh, which is broadcast. It's a virtual meeting. Uh, there's a YouTube link. Um, and Don is joining us. He's in the planning department, which is probably a better fit than someone who's in the uh, uh, solid So uh, he's very excited. I met with him last week, and, and he's great. He also has GIS skills and um, so he's really on the ball and motivated, and that's very exciting for us. Uh, it helps us a lot. Uh, so we'll be moving ahead with that. We are hopefully going to hear uh, about bronze certification, I think Friday is when it gets announced. So um, that will be nice. Um, and it's, it's pretty close, so I hope we get it. Uh, and then the uh, I think folks know this, but uh, Cornell... Um, is working on a, a climate adaptation and resilience plan for the county, uh, which was funded through DEC and many towns have also joined on. And there are four cohorts of groups of towns that are kind of geographically located throughout the, the county who will be uh, consulted and, um, and brought into this process to add information, uh, concerns about uh, climate impacts and how we can adapt to them 
uh, in the coming years. Um, that project is really just getting off to a start right now. There was an informational session a couple of months ago, but I don't really have an update. Uh, in fact, our partner at Cornell will be giving us an update on Thursday. So I don't know. I, don't, I think it's just beginning. Uh, there, there will be opportunities for input, and that's the important thing that will make sure that people are aware of. Uh, that's part of the collaboration between the county and the towns. Um, and there's, you know, work planning and, and other, uh, other stuff that's further down the line, but that's, that's the basic update for the County. Great. Thank you. Can sure. I ask you a question, David? Sure. Um, are you seeing the climate adaptation program as a, um, enhancement to the climate smart community program? Cause we're trying to figure out in Germantown how that overlaps with both our LWRP and our climate smart efforts. And we're a little unclear at this point about where those things should intersect. And I just wondered if you had any experience with anybody else with those kinds of questions. I don't. Uh, that would be a good question for um, for the folks at Cornell and for others that have had more experience. I mean, the adaptation plan, the way it's uh, it has a lot of roles, you know, a plan like that or a lot of um, it it's provides a lot of information that can provide input to other processes for sure. Uh, in terms of emergency planning and in terms of other concerns that go outside of uh, just purely looking at it through the lens of adapting to climate change. I mean, it, it gets into infrastructure uh, and um, capacity to meet needs of, of uh, vulnerable people in our community and things like that. So there, it's a pretty broad, it can, be, it can be used for a lot of different purposes. Uh, we're doing it through the Climate Smart program, obviously, but it will be a, a document that has hopefully consulted kind of like the natural resource inventory for right. uh, a lot of different purposes. Right. I see. Sorry, Thank I don't you. have a better answer, but I, no, I mean, answer. It's something that we should continue to talk about. I'd like to become more educated on that too, you know, and just to how, how, how we can integrate an adaptation plan into more of the fabric of, <clears throat> of the work that's being done in our communities, you know, by our Go local governments. There weren't a lot of towns with um, river frontage in that introduct that launch meeting. It was, I think it was just Germantown and Hudson. Hmm. And so that was interesting to me because so much we're so focused on the local waterfront revitalization plan. And it's a lot about water encroachment into our small parks and those kinds of things and maybe raising levels and permeable parking lots and all kinds of things like that. But it would, so the cohort we were put in didn't have those issues at all. And right. Well, I, I mean, the cohort doesn't necessarily have to have consistent, you know, concerns. It just made sense to split it, to bring people together. Uh, that's how they did it. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think these are concerns that are broadly, um, you know, that, that are, are felt throughout the County and that the, the, by the County taking a lead on this project, uh, it's not as if we're only looking at the concerns of the participating towns. Not every town had actually explicitly signed up to collaborate, you know, as part of Climate Smart. Um, and they did that partly because they're more active. They have certain concerns they wanted to make sure are heard. And they have a, an active Climate Smart um, uh, group that that um, saw it made sense for them to participate with kind of little cost, you know, just kind of, uh, tag yeah. along and, and hopefully add a lot of input, but not have to coordinate or do any of the work really. Uh, and so, but, but my point is that the County has an obligation to represent the concerns throughout the whole County. And that is what will make sure happen. So, you know, your voice in Germantown is important, not just in Germantown, but those concerns where they apply throughout the County I and mean, you raise them and other people are raised in other communities and hopefully it, it asks the right questions so we don't miss anything um, throughout the, the rest of the county. Yeah, thank you. Sure. John. Yeah, um, Barbara, I've been uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, what this means uh, for us in Claverick. And uh, one of the things I did, I asked uh, Lindsay um, uh, and um, the uh, Cornell staff, uh, for to refer me to some other plans, and I found it really helpful. To I read uh, the Orange County plan, uh, and they have waterfront uh, towns, and then Croton on Hudson, and it really helped me see the far huge range of different land use, and I mean, and, 
and uh, nature protection and other uh, other issues. It was uh, just for me, that was a helpful thing because I really don't have that good a sense of what it means. And I, I don't really know how to talk to the town board and say, this is something that's worth your time right. to pay attention to. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's that's a great reference you just gave me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. I'll forward uh, at Lindsay's uh, email to you. Okay, great. Bruce, you put uh, Christina's um, information. She's it's the, if the community energy project manager, community energy, heat smart capital region, capital region, clean energy hub. It's quite <laughs> a title. Uh, so I put it all in there. That's in her email. I don't know how they manage that, but that's, right. that makes introductions difficult. But she's really good. Uh, they've got a great website, which I'll I'm not sure it's that. Um, but it's on our our website, our CSC website. I'll I'll find it and put it in there as well. She's my neighbor here in Germantown. She's on LWRP and Climate Smart Community here. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks so much, David. Sure. Bruce, you had a hand up. Yeah, I mean, it, it went away. She, she mentioned something about clean energy communities. I thought that was her question, but that clearly wasn't. But anyway, what, when it came up, um, Steve Powers, who's our chairman of our Climate Smart Community has been doing a lot of work with the clean energy communities and he's doing a, um, a presentation tomorrow at their meeting at 10 o'clock. I don't know if everybody got the, the notice from NYSERDA about the webinar tomorrow at 10 o'clock about clean energy. We've gotten close to $100,000 in grants from our clean energy program. So um, it's something people might want to be aware of. I don't know. Did people get the... Um, the notice for the meeting tomorrow? I don't know. No. no. Um, no. I'll pass. I'll pass it on to Michael, and maybe he'll pass it on to everybody. Is that be all right? Great. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. Great. Be great. Okay. Yeah, it would be easy to forget that the Clean Energy Communities Program is operating because it's it's run by NYSERDA, and the Climate Smart Communities is a DEC project, uh, and we got uh, here in Hudson quite a bit of money. I forget what the number is. Um, from the uh, clean energy community program first and it's it's actually easier to do than uh, the climate smart program mm -hmm. okay any other questions or comments about uh, climate smart or heat smart okay john what's uh, what's next um uh, i i'm not very particularly into the loop with zero waste uh, uh, at the moment. They had a meeting last week, I believe, and I haven't seen a summary of the meeting yet, so I can't really uh, say anything. Okay. Well, zero waste. Uh, but Tara may have better. Tara might be better, closer to it than I am. Okay. I haven't, I haven't heard anything from the folks with the reduces program on where they're at with that. Um, they seem to be going forward ahead with it, but um, I haven't gotten any feedback. I can send an email to the lady who was reaching out to me just to see how they're doing with it. I haven't heard anything from any any restaurant operators lately either. So um, it might have just stalled up over the holidays and didn't, didn't get back up started again. Um, I did want to mention, though, with regard to zero waste, there was a concern brought up recently in our agency about uh, all of the the unused office equipment and supplies and chairs and furniture and filing cabinets that are just going to the transfer station and there's no effort to repurpose them, recycle mm. them at the county level. It's a tremendous amount of waste. Wow. So putting that out there for whoever talks to the who's who, that, you know, it, it just seems like there should be a place for those items that you know, I would consider them lightly used, not even broken, that they could be taken to a place that could repurpose them for people who need equipment for offices that, you know, maybe can't even afford to buy it new because that, that stuff can be expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of um, programs get grant funding and stuff. So, you know, every few, few years they'll replace their chairs or what have you. And the stuff that they're getting rid of is really not that bad. So, you hmm. know. Seems like a lot of waste there. There was a opportunity a, to reduce it. <laughs> oh, indeed, uh, there was a feature article in the New Sunday New York Times this week about 
um, entrepreneurs who have seen that opportunity in uh, California uh, with you know all of the the layoffs and the tech companies and uh, have you know big warehouses full uh, yeah. of things and a, and a couple of people who just started with a storage unit someplace and grew from it so that's something that uh, that ought to be made note of uh, so some some bright person with uh, perhaps a barn or something can uh, take advantage of uh, the opportunity. The same yeah. thing occurs with dorms at the uh, universities. Oh, indeed, sure. Yeah, and there are businesses that uh, have taken that up. Hmm. Mm, okay. Uh, John, what's what else is up here? Oh, well, Bruce, pardon me. Uh, Bruce, you're muted. On, on, on the zero waste, um, there's a repair cafe this weekend that I want, in case people don't know, there's a repair cafe in, at the Austerlitz Town Hall from 10 to 2. It won't be gigantic. It'll be fairly large, but it'll be um, probably 15 or so repairs, um, bicycles, sewing, lamps, et cetera. So um, that fits into the zero waste thing. Wonderful. So 10 to 2 on Saturday, just show up if you have anything and we will fix it. Great. Well, uh, What's the location? The, the Austerlitz Town Hall, which is Town just Hall. an antique store. It's right on 203, right in Spencertown. Thank you. Great. Well, yep. that, that 15, uh, 15 repair people uh, counts as pretty good size. In my yep. Book. yep. That's, yep. That's but it's great. not as big as the Climate Carnival or or some of the other ones, but it, but it should, it should be very good. And it was on the front page of the register star on Friday. So there may be more people than we're expecting, but we're ready. Wonderful. Wonderful. More of those. Need more. Well, the next one is in April, April 30th in new Lebanon, just, just down the road, but <laughs> keep it coming. Right. Yep. Did you have something to say? Rick, where was you're muted or are you just stretching your hand? Who? Rick. Oh. No, I think he's relating to some other uh, some other screen right now. <laughs> I can't see him. Yeah. Well, in any case, John, what's uh, what's what's on the agenda here? Uh, Kara, Tara's back on the agenda. Number seven, County Health Department. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have some things here. Uh, the the biggest thing that happened recently that's of interest is that the Columbia County just had its first positive um, uh, poultry flock. It was positive for the highly pathogenic avian influenza, HBAI, mm. and it was the H5N1 virus. Mm. So apparently the, um, the CDC, they confirmed, I guess, last January that this virus has been circulating in the United States in the wild bird population, waterfowl, and so so on and so forth. Um, and I looked up, we actually had in Columbia County, back at the end of um, October, a bald eagle that, that was found deceased, I guess, and reported to the DEC, which tested positive for this strain of virus, and um, also a peregrine falcon on the 25th of October. Um, it doesn't say where in the county it occurred, um, but we were notified a couple, uh, week before last um, by the State Department of Agriculture and Markets that they were responding to a, a farm that lost a flock of birds um, that di died within two weeks of, of getting infected. It spread through the entire flock. Of all 250 birds were, were lost. Mm. So USDA, in um, conjunction with state agriculture, Ag agriculture um, went in to do whatever it is they do to secure that area and remove those birds to um, properly destroy of everything. And from what I understand, they can't um, touch that area or go back into that for 150 days. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a highly pathogenic virus, and the the they they say the they believe that the risk to humans transmission is low. There have been cases of human infection of this in the world. Um, what they're worried about now is human to human. So they were monitoring about 10 folks, I think 
eight or 10 folks that had contact with these birds, close contact in the, in the birdhouse or whatever have you, um, just monitoring to make sure they didn't come down with symptoms of the flu infection because then there would have to be some sort of quarantine so that they don't transmit it to other people um, because it's it's got a very high mortality rate. It's it's on the order of um, like COVID 50 to 60 percent mortality rate. We're talking the, the initial variant when we got Delta that had a very high mortality rate associated with it. So this was actually what they thought w- would cause the pandemic, you know, 10 years ago when they started talking about the fact that we were overdue for a pandemic, avian influenza was what they thought would cause a human uh, pandemic. So oh, let's hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> we're still recovering from, from the past couple of years, but so that seems to be under control, but just knowing that, you know, uh, geese and migratory birds coming through the area have been infected with it. There's been, uh, I think Dutchess County, Ulster County had some positive, um, outbreaks, um, where, where some birds were lost. So we're not the only ones, but it's the first time this has happened in our County. So that was, that was something we hadn't dealt with till now. Um, We've had just one skunk test positive for rabies so far this year. So hopefully it won't be too, too busy with that. Um, the first of our four rabies vaccination clinics for dogs, cats, and ferrets is coming up on March 4th. That's down in Ankrum at the town highway garage. Um, I think it starts 10 a.m. as cats and ferrets and 11 to 12 noon is for dogs. And that's down at their highway garage in Ankrumdale. Um they held the last of the COVID uh, vaccination clinics out at the Clovert Fire Company last Thursday. So now they've shifted back to having them on Thursdays at the health department by appointment from like three to five in the afternoon every week. So if people, if folks still want to get vaccinated for flu or COVID, they can still c- call and come in and get their their shots at our, our offices. It just, there weren't enough people coming and setting all that up. So um, let me see. Um, somebody, I think Kara had asked last time about the tick drag um, that they did last fall. And I looked back in the records and that report was released by the state health department March 1st last year. So I'm guessing within the next couple of days, that's probably when we're going to get it. So <laughs> stay tuned. I can, if I get something like, you know, I can forward along, I'll do that. If not, I'll just report what, what was found last fall at the next meeting. Um, I think that's probably everything. COVID numbers are pretty, you know, steady. We're at 173 folks in the county who have passed from COVID. 18 were hospitalized, one in the ICU as of February 6th. So, um, you know, no upticks there or anything like that. And uh, I think that's all I had. Oh, and I did get a a report from the state health department that they've approved of a plan for the town of Germantown where they found that area of contamination in the groundwater. Um, So they approved a plan for, you know, going forward and doing some more um, testing down there to try to determine a source of that. So so that's that's what I had to report. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. That's helpful. All right, John, the next item. Uh, other business. Oh, okay. Well, here we are. What's going on, folks, that uh, the rest of us would uh, would find useful? Lee, or not Lee, but... <laughs> Christian. Christian. Uh, my yes. name, but uh, I... Uh, brought up the matter of the uh, of our opening for articles published in the Register Star mm. to uh, let the newer people uh, know about that. One aspect that I forgot to mention is that because we are actually an arm of the county government, anything that gets published under our name needs to go through county attorneys. And so when you have an article prepared, it needs to be sent first to uh, town attorneys before it goes to the Register Star. Usually takes a month, but uh, it's no big deal. It has to be done. Right. Otherwise, you can just send it under your own name. If, If you're not 
listing the the identity of the writer as being associated with uh, with the county government. So that's uh, uh, what what prompts a and what makes a uh, a letter to the editor that will get published is something that's relevant now, uh, either in response to a, a news item or some some situation that's happening that will make the the letter interesting to the readership, and which the editors will then say, "Oh, well, this is this is related and." Not something that happened months uh, months earlier. Other stuff is perennial, and they they would find it interesting just you know over a longer term. So I mentioned it because one uh, aspect of that impulse was to get the EMC known in the county since we're otherwise invisible. Correct. Yeah. No. Uh, that that's that's a valuable uh, thing to do. I think so. Uh, but just understand you know if it's if it's urgent then just you know put your own name on it and get the word out anybody else oh let's see john i'll um last last uh, month we had some discussion of this uh, homegrown uh national mm. park uh the the dotalami video and uh we are re-showing that and, uh, on, on Earth Day at the Clavic Library, and then a week after that, a month after that, uh, another event that, uh, that will have a panel to, to talk about uh, how to how to uh, plant natives for to increase biodiversity in your yard. But um, uh, I think Peter is still very interested. He's still very active and uh, working with a number of people in maybe towns. So it's it's something that's really and Bob can probably speak more to it, um, right? Uh, but it's really uh, uh, it was just it's just neat to see uh, the enthusiasm, uh, and um, and and it fits right in with uh, so many other things. It, the uh, was it the uh, Karakin comment on this the the, uh, the conic headwaters uh, uh, planning uh, group met a couple a week or two ago, and uh, we also talked about that because. Promoting biodiversity and uh, uh, in the, throughout the headwaters of the Taconic is is an important it sort of overlaps with a lot of things that uh, need to be done. So that's that's still very alive, and maybe Bob can say more. All right, Bob. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, I know that Peter has been re uh, has reached out to uh, a bunch of you, and there are a lot of discussions going on about both of the, both the Taconic headwaters and the Talame, the, the homegrown national parks. We had spoken at at our meeting uh, last uh, in January about the concept of setting up a subcommittee, an EMC subcommittee, to explore the homegrown national park yeah. thing. And it seems like after we've talked about it, after Peter and I have talked about it, that there's enough kind of crosstalk going on that maybe we don't need another real bureaucracy to, to push this forward. And that maybe what we need to do is set up, just make sure that we're all communicating with each other about this. It's, it's great to see that the Talame video is going to get shown in a couple of places. I mean, again, not to, I know we're all, pre, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the beauty of this is that it's involving the populace. It's involving people in a program where there's something they can do that can actually take an action. And to that, we're continuing to schedule talks and meetings on an almost monthly basis into conic that that uh, that relate to the in one way or another the pollinator projects or the gardening projects, and so right now I, again I'm leaving this in Peter's hands because he seems to have a lot of outreach, and I think he feels that uh, he'd like to talk to everybody and try to put something together before we try to establish anything formal. Uh, Bob, uh, yeah. are you referring to Peter Payton? I'm sorry, I am. I'm sorry, I am. John had mentioned Peter, so I, I guess I jumped to the fact we all knew who Peter. I just wanted to make sure for the record. Thank you. Right. So, and as far as the Headwaters Project go, I think we all we all have the sense that we have something incredibly important here, but we're not quite sure how to how to weaponize it yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's right. You know, so I think we want to continue to think about about that. Yeah, uh, John. Just, that, oh, sorry. Y'all go, please, Kara. Yeah, no, John, that was what we met about last week with the group. It's just the original stakeholders who were 
um, involved in the headwaters plan. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, I, 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 I'm, Bob, I'm glad you brought up the idea that maybe we don't need to do another subcommittee because I see from the notes when we look at the minutes to approve the minutes from our last call, we did talk about possibly trying to do something through the county right. group here. Um, Copake is also scheduling a presentation of the Talley video as well. I says, I'm not sure it's going to be on Earth Day, but that's I think that's the current plan right now too. So we'll be uh, we'll be hitting a lot with Talley on Earth Day if it ends up working out. <clears throat> And the only other thing I, uh, if I mentioned just be reporting in from Taconic is that we are also exploring the idea. I know that uh, that uh, Betsy Albert has been concerned about uh, the treatment of the beavers and the, the uh, in Taconic and and around. I don't know if anybody has even heard of this, but there is a there is a, an outfit called I'm trying to find it here, the Beaver Institute. That is apparently the idea is to explore ways of taking care of the the beaver dam problem without just blowing up the dams and uh, and getting rid of the beavers. So we're exploring that as well. We don't have much more information on that. We're going to have a meeting with them. Um, so that's what's going on here. Great, Colleen. Yeah, um, I just wanted to report that Ancrum CAC is hosting um, the Doug Tallamy video. I believe it's April 24th at the Rojan Library. So um, they are also, we're also working on um, doing some outreach in Ancrum about uh, lawns and, and how to minimize lawns and create more biodiverse space. Wonderful. Anybody else? Just just um, back to that one more. I, th I think what we're all looking for, we we keep dancing around, is a way to find to find a way that we can actually get uh, a situation where people can get a, a gardener or somebody, an expert, to come to their places and advise them on uh, on on how to plant their gardens or what to do with their gardens, and whether there's a way maybe to get some funding so that we can actually uh, have a have a group of gardeners who might be on call or might be available to do that and get paid at the same time. So um, um, I, I know this is not a forum for me promoting myself, but that's actually what I do for a living. There you go. <laughs> that's but, what I but, but would you be available to do it on a, a not certainly not on an on-call basis, but in terms of, uh, uh, if if we if we got a, a, a large number of people who wanted to do that, many of whom might not have a lot of resources, right? You know, yeah, we'd have to we'd have, we should sit down and brainstorm about it at some point. Yes. And talk yeah. about maybe there's a few of us that could pitch in together and take different aspects of that. But I think yeah, it would I, be, yeah, I just it thought would, I should would, share that that is what yeah. I do. Well, <laughs> it is wonderful, and I think it would be a really valuable a, a valuable. Uh, outreach and it would really again it would get pull the community together and get people excited about what they can do yeah that sounds great thanks barbara okay if Colleen. i may if yeah if i may enter into that um we actually did uh something like that in ancrum we've got a subcommittee of our our kind of our cac and csc and it's called a it's basically um a sustainable gardening group so my suggestion to you might be to start something in your own community where you reach out broadly and ask if there are people that are within your own community that have expertise or want to learn and create a, a group that that meets and actually, you know, takes on tasks like, you know, um, could be simple tasks like how to teach people how to seed start, you know, just start that way and we've had an excellent response i mean i think there's been about 30 people that have actually signed up to kind of you know knowledge share in this group so my suggestion to both of you might be to do something like that where you can kind of leverage your your existing committees and see if you have interest to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are. I know we're also. That's that's great. We're doing a uh, actually doing a planting on uh, on May twentieth 
uh, for uh, for the town to come. We're going to plant some. We we have some beds, and we're going to do some pollinator planting uh, just for people to come and stick a seed in the ground and go home with some seeds, maybe. But again, the idea of promoting that. But I think these are all great ideas, and it's really exciting. I think one thing that has always seemed like a um, bit of a missing link in the process, because so much, a lot of this work involves limiting or eliminating sometimes mm -hmm. invasive plants, right? And there's a lot of work. I mean, when I started doing this stuff 20 plus years ago, it was kind of like fringy. <laughs> That's no longer mm -hmm. true. A lot of people care very deeply and see the importance of this work. But the missing link sometimes is the road crews because it's boots and tires and birds. You know, that's how this stuff is moving around. So if you've got Japanese stilt grass or honeysuckle going to seed along the roadways, people are bringing it home. Mm -hmm. And so like mm -hmm. teaching the road crews when it's when is the right time to mow? Don't you know, you got to hit it just right. So things are not producing seed and, um, you know, treating in a timely fashion would be a huge step. So from the point of view of the municipalities and, and the state roads too, and county roads, we have to at, at some point work our way towards that so that if there's areas that have been neglected for a really long time and they're really infested with this, these limiting species, these interruptive species, then um, we're kind of, we're going against ourselves. So you can mm -hmm. really do a great job on your property, large or small, and then still have the mailman driving down your driveway with it, you know? And so long-term, it would be great to figure out a way to train the, um, the road crews. That would that's, be that's a really great point, Barbara. Um, at the, at the um, state level, there is effort. Um, that this our like the DOT and stuff like that. There is an effort right. to kind of reduce invasives, but at the local and county level, we don't see a lot of engagement. Um, mm -hmm. I work for the Heritage Program, and I work with invasive species and the database and all of that. So, um, did you say the Heritage see... Program, Colleen? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm a biologist with the Heritage Program. So what but part of my part of my job is to work with the invasive species database and the thing is is we don't see a lot of engagement with the local road crews and that is a huge issue mm -hmm. huge so um yeah if there, if we could brainstorm a way to somehow um make a program that's enticing to them to to actually come and learn about right the proper time to mow when it, you know if you miss the window what should, what should you do you know all of that um to reduce the spread of invasives so i agree with you completely <laughs> right i mean it's it's a it's a big task and it's complex i talked to dot at one point about um 9g and they said it's it gets really complicated because some old properties own to the middle to the double yellow line and some there's a setback where they're you know free to work and it gets really complicated but i think if there was public awareness about it and the showing the talamy film and having these conversations and working in big and small ways about biodiversity enhancement um if we could get people on board it would simplify the process a lot you know sort of get have the will of the communities be behind mm -hmm. it. but um so we're doing uh, we're doing Earth Day programs where here in Germantown now where there's at our parsonage the historic uh, site here from the early 1700s where a whole big group of people including high school students came and um, I sort of directed traffic about what to remove and when and how to, you know how to take care of things that we want to keep and make room for them and do all that so that was kind of a first step last Earth Day. So we're going to do that again and um, just keep marching along. But anyway, that's that's what's who, happened here so far. Who, uh, who, contro who controls the, the road crews? Is that, does, does the town board have any, uh, yeah. the town boards? Yeah. So if you could, if you could present this to the town boards, is that a way, is that a way forward or is that, 
I mean, it seems like a huge, heavy lift, but. Uh, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's kind of getting, it, it makes, it makes it seem like yeah. things are going to go very slowly for them and they yeah. already feel kind of overburdened perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, understaffed, I guess is really what's probably happening. But um, yeah, if you talk to the town boards and then talk to the person in, in charge of roads and said, you know, how can we help you, you know, get this moving in the right direction and see, see what they say. Um, it would be, it, it would be a learning curve because you have to, and you have to identify plants. You're not just out mowing. Yeah. yeah. But some people are going to be interested. And in if they, you know, if they have that kind of uh, flexibility or interest, it, it wouldn't be that. Hard, I don't think. Okay. Carol. Um, hi. Yeah. So since you're brainstorming on this, um, I thought that maybe this, this has to do with resiliency and maybe this is uh, an idea to bring to a program like the climate smart communities you know we have or like clean energy we have training your building inspector for uh you know green uh energy efficient buildings maybe we could have something about training the road crews and other community trainings because it is a heavy lift. There's a lot of knowledge involved. You know, I'm also a native plant designer. We're losing you, Carol. I'm also um, a native plant landscape design person, but I'm saying it's a heavy lift for uh, educating people. And if they really don't have the interest, but once once we have this foundation going where people are starting to see all the movement with the Doug Tallamy movies, I think we should add a, like something and try to get it through the DEC Climate Smart Program or through the adaptation as a recommendation would be educating our road crews. You know, there's the plant issue and there's the bad salt issue. And um, anyway, I'm just throwing it out there that, you know, having it be something you get points for or, you know, some kind of a parent. Mm -hmm. There actually is, I believe, an item, an action item in the Climate Smart uh, Communities program, I think, for uh, about invasive species, or it's part of one of the action items. Um, another place to, that maybe we, we could look at is the Cornell Local Roads Program. They handle a lot of the training for the depart, like the local DPWs, and maybe they might be a way to kind of maybe talking to them and seeing if, if that could be part of the curriculum or uh, something that they might want to, you know, it kind of promote. Interesting. Hmm. Cornell Local Roads, is that through uh, extension or what is that? Um, I, I don't know if it's actually through a specific extension, but I do know that it, it's the, if you, if, if you Googled it, it, you could find it. Okay. Thanks. Um, and a lot of them, they do, they do training through there. Um, and I think they also sponsor the, what they call like the highway school for the state. So where they, you know, they go and get training specifically, I mean, it's kind of targeted towards supervisors, but it also, you know, like new road um, and maintenance people as well. Excellent. Great. Okay. All right, Christian. Yeah, this is a great discussion. I think it's really important. And I, it seems to me that this is really the place for this discussion. And probably the only one that exists that's really the place for this discussion. <laughs> and the next, uh, you know, it's not the kind of thing uh, we rarely have uh, topics where we can really conceive of this group being involved in action. The Climate Smart Communities for the county level was was a was a big step. And one thing is comes to mind: a, a friend of mine who was a local politician. Uh, in training, uh, let's say, I mean, he was quite successful, but he, he learned it on the fly. And he said, it's really important to distinguish between strategy and tactics. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I, I, it does seem that this would be a, a place, not necessarily a subcommittee, but at least an interest group uh, amongst us. And uh, uh, if it were an interest group, we could bring in some others. But I think that to develop some great ideas, but to get to turn them into tactics is that, uh, you know, the notion of broadly educating the road crews. Uh, there's a lot of road crews and uh, they you, you mentioned the time issue. That's very real. But much more is that they can't handle amorphous information. They can't handle being told that there's a lot of good things they could be doing. Uh, this knowledge that Barbara was talking about, for instance, of, of when to do what is absolutely vital information to them. It's not only vital in, in, in the sense that we're of our ideals, but it's also vital in the, in the sense of them being able to act. There's one thing that happens with those crews is that they always have in between time. You know, they've got one project, they finish that, they've got to move to another project, they've got to set up and do that project. Uh, when they have knowledge about things that they can do with the in-between time, then they have the possibility to actually be effective and do something with it. Um, I'd also like to mention that another uh, way that this is a good place for this conversation is that the county is one big player in this. And... Uh, uh, the public works department, all the same applies to them. Um, but we had uh, Ron Knott step in to the climate smart communities work, and he is the county rep for public works. So he's a, a good person to talk to. He's pretty good about, he's, he's pretty open about being practical about this kind of work. Um, and to find some Maybe if, if, for instance, uh, as, as one tactic, people who may know their uh, town highway supervisors from other work that they've done uh, with culverts, for instance, with road salt, uh, may know some of those who are particularly approachable for conversation. And uh, to, to, to uh, discover uh, a couple of representative individuals, it makes a really big deal mm -hmm. if you say so-and-so is doing it. And so-and-so is doing it because we've come with the knowledge and sat down with them to have a conversation about how to implement and to ask them what they need from us. And yeah. the other is, I think, the, the mention that if that's an action item for the CSCs, that's another level of gold because... The CFCs collectively have a lot of volunteers, and uh, and they actually don't hit me for saying this, but they don't have enough to do. Or is there other because? <laughs> well, you know, in a sense of given the pool, then there are certain projects for so and so, but there are other people who are there because they actually want projects, meaningful things to do, uh, and to to sort of be able to approach them in the same way, I think is another good tactic. Mm. That's good thinking. All right, John. Uh, yeah, I had no idea when I mentioned the Talami thing that it could take off into so many directions. Uh, but uh, which, which is, I think, one of the things that just me is why it's so exciting because it triggers the mind. It would be nice if somebody is, uh, I don't have the knowledge about most of these topics to to to, to put much down on paper, but it would be nice if somebody could sort of outline some of these things. And, and we need to find a way of making sure that we uh, are sharing it. And I don't know what the best way of doing that is, but I just wanted to sort of get it in the minutes that uh, we want to figure out some way of making sure we can share that. And I had no idea that there was so much expertise in these areas on this group, you know, Biologists and you know these are uh, these are the uh, the real things where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I agree. It's also you know as a relative newcomer here, I'm still trying to get myself acclimated and know what I I know a lot of most of the stuff I don't know. <laughs> I'm being very honest about that, but I keep learning something every time, and it would be nice to try to get 
some place where we could pull this information together so it's easier to share it and then communicate it to everybody because I'm, I'm at a bit of a loss sometimes when I come here and I'm now getting more acclimated with my, my town's CAC, CSC, sorry. Um, but it's still a bit of a struggle for me. So I'm trying to find the right place for me to, to do the most help and be the most useful. So I would welcome any kind of easier place for me to get my information. Well, I think this is a I think this is a great forum. I, I, I what's happening, what's just happened here in the last half hour, I think is uh, you know really important for us to Absolutely. to use to use this meeting these meetings to do that. I wanted to I wanted to uh, John. I wanted to agree with you that I think that uh, uh, it would be great to get some a sheet maybe from Barbara or from somebody just in terms of kind of laying out what you Barbara what you told us. I know that we uh, in Taconic. I think we have may have an opening with our supervisor of roads who is new who has been, I mentioned before the beaver situation, but he has actually been not difficult to uh, to approach about the possibility of getting the road crew to rethink how they handle that. It seems to me that this, what we talked about here is is actually a more important, a more, uh, in a way, a more important uh, thing to approach. But if we could get a couple of road supervisors to at least consider the option and talk about how they would handle that and what the obstacles would be it, it might be a way to proceed forward so well uh, this is uh so somewhat tangential but in uh another week we're gonna have a uh gathering of the department heads the town board the planning people there's so much going on in germantown right now and all the committee members from all these different committees lwrp climate smart community we got a zoning committee we got a parks committee and everybody's going to get together and talk. So I will be in the same room with a lot of people who kind of have, you know, uh, a stake in this in terms of funding goals and the advancement of conditions, mm. environmental conditions in town. And I'll talk to the highway supervisor. And uh, he's a very nice man. We talked about doing a pollinator garden at our town park. And so that's something that we're looking forward to hopefully doing this coming season and um, that I would design, but um, why don't I have that conversation and then I'll put together just a, like a single page of what the issues are. Cause he'll say, well, I have to consider this and this and this and things that I, you know, I don't do what he does, nor does he do what I do. So um, I, I'll do that and I'll keep this in mind and I'll, I'll make notes for everyone to share. That'd be terrific. Sure. Mm. Great. Colleen. Sorry, I just I oh. forgot to put my hand down. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Michael, were you going to say something? You're muted. Michael Grisham. Uh, there we go. Sorry. That's right. Well, I, just, I just wanted to say I, ha I have an available highway supervisor separately elected from the town government. I don't know how many towns in the county have that arrangement. The Green Board has an independent highway department at the town level. Right. Good. I, I don't know. That, I think that's the norm for towns, isn't it? Ours is elected, too. Yeah, separately. Clever, too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In a city, they're hired, so. Mm -hmm. You're lucky. <laughs> I just mentioned that, about that since somebody asked about the town board. Uh, the supervisor typically is elected and doesn't work for the town board. And there are some times uh, we had a, uh, supervi a uh, highway supervisor who uh, said that specifically. Don't tell me what to do. Uh, so just have it in mind. It's not uh, often that there's an antagonism. But, and the town board is definitely worth y y getting on board. But uh, the super, him or herself, is the one that. We just actually had a change in Taconic. We had that situation where our previous uh, roads guy was uh, my way of the highway. And uh, uh, and the, the board wanted to take uh, take back supervision. And so we have, I think the board has taken back supervision. We have a new supervisor now. So. All right. 
Okay. Um, one of the items we didn't get to earlier in the uh, in the meeting because we didn't have enough people was to um, approve yes. the minutes from last month. Do we have a mo to motion to approve? So move. All right. And, Who was that, John? Uh, I, uh, John said he he uh, so move. fields a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. Okay. And uh, a second. Second. All right. Christian, all not in favor, say hi or say no. All right. The uh, motion was passed uh, unanimously. So, folks, if uh, we've we've uh, shared enough for one one evening, I can suggest we uh, we we call it a day. I move to be adjourned. All right. <laughs> that's 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 the key. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks Thank so you. much, everybody. Good Great everyone. meeting. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.